Yeah, thank you everyone for attending this uh, virtual talk. I'm you know, really glad that I can still give this talk virtually and I sincerely hope everybody is you know, safe and healthy uh, during this time. So with that, yeah, I'm very excited to be able to talk about my work on learning to understand visual data with minimal human supervision. Okay, so once upon a time when I was starting my PhD, this was about 10 years ago, there were very few visual recognition systems that worked. We had systems that could detect faces, recognize fingerprints, and maybe recognize a zip code in your mail, uh, but that was pretty much about it. But something big happened. And over the past 10 years, there was a big shift and visual recognition research literally exploded. We now have systems that can accurately classify images, detect objects, recognize human pose, and many more. And this success in visual recognition research has translated to an explosion in students wanting to study computer vision in startups, in funding, <clears throat> in hiring, uh, and of course papers. So in last year's CVPR, which is the top computer vision conference, the program chairs estimated that at the current rate of paper submissions, there'd be more than 10 billion submitted papers in 2028. Okay. Now, of course, they were joking when they, when they made this estimation, uh, but I think this demonstrates the excitement and uh, rapid growth that we've had in uh, the past few years. And as part of this journey, uh, my research has also played a small part in the success, and I wanted to first give you a brief taste of some of the projects that I contributed. So I've created a system that can take hours of video taken from a wearable camera to produce a concise visual summary uh, of the camera wears day, focusing on the most important people and objects. A method that can detect correspondences between the same object part over time okay, in order to model visual style. An automatic drawing assistant that can predict what the user is drawing and then create these shadows that can guide the user in what to draw next. And the fastest instant segmentation method currently out there. So this method can segment objects and images in real time while being only slightly worse in accuracy compared to the state of the art. Now, of course, it wouldn't be a real time method without a real time demo. And normally when I give this presentation, I would do it, um, you know, give a live uh, demo presentation in person. Uh, but unfortunately with video conferencing, there's um, some technical issues. So what I've done instead is I've pre-recorded a live demo and I'm gonna show you a video of that now. So what this system does is it does three things. It detects objects, which you see with these uh, detected boxes. It also segments them, segments them which you see with the uh, masks. And it also classifies the detected objects, which you see with the uh, semantic uh, labels. And of course, the system isn't perfect. You can see we can construct these kind of cases to fool it. Uh, but overall, it's uh, quite impressive, right? And what's really cool that cool is that although the system was trained on an image data set, it just works out of the box in real world environments uh, in, in real time speed. So if you look at the top left corner, it's currently running at 20 frames per second on a, a GPU laptop. And if you had shown me this kind of result 10 years ago, I wouldn't have believed it because I would have thought that this is several decades away. So let's now take a step back as scientists and try to figure out right, what changed in the last decade that has led to all of this success. And I would love to tell you that it's because we computer vision researchers are so clever, uh, but in fact, the three uh, primary drivers are uh, big compute uh, provided by GPUs, big models in the form of deep neural networks, and big label data. And in fact, the algorithms that we use today are largely similar to those that we had 20 years ago. So in fact, it's the size of the models combined with big label data and fast compute that's driving uh, this success today. So is computer vision solved then? That is, do we just need to get bigger compute, bigger models, and bigger label data? Well, not quite. Although our GPUs are getting faster over time, and our deep neural networks are getting bigger and deeper over time, the size of the data sets that we use to train our algorithms 
have largely remained static since 2012. In fact, the largest image data set that we still use today is ImageNet, which has a million images. So why is this the case, right? What's, what's going on here? Well, first of all, it's because getting labeled data, in other words, human supervision, can be extremely expensive. Right? So let's take semantic segmentation as an example. This is a task that requires each pixel in a training image to be labeled with its corresponding semantic category. And this can be extremely expensive. So to give you one statistic, to create MS Coco, which is the de facto benchmark data set for training and evaluating such algorithms, required more than 70,000 annotation hours to create. So that translates to eight human years. Yet it only has 330,000 images for 80 object categories. So clearly this is not a scalable solution if we want to create visual recognition systems that can understand hundreds of thousands of visual concepts. The other issue with supervision is that it can often be challenging to know exactly what to annotate. So if I ask you which of these two faces look more masculine, then it's quite easy to say it's the person on the right. But if I then ask you to label right, at the pixel level, what exactly makes that person look masculine, then this can be quite challenging. So often there's ambiguity in knowing exactly what to label in the data. And because of these challenges with supervision, Today's success stories in computer vision are largely limited to applications in which lots of labeled data can be easily and unambiguously acquired. And I strongly believe that our field's current reliance on access to big labeled data will be the bottleneck for tomorrow's success. So to address these challenges with supervision, my research uh, focuses on creating algorithms that can learn to understand visual data with minimal human supervision. Now this is very challenging because without strong supervision, deep networks can easily cheat and take suboptimal shortcuts. So as an example, if we take these images uh, uh, from the ImageNet data set and label them as both, right, and we train a bulk classifier and fire that classifier on this image, then this classifier can still mispredict this as both because there's high correlation between the ocean horizon and, and boats. And because we've never annotated in these images at the pixel level, which pixels correspond to both. Therefore, in order to address this challenge, my work fo uh, focuses on ways to force the models to work harder by imposing specific constraints so that they learn to reason and arrive at solutions that generalize better rather than take suboptimal shortcuts. And in today's talk, I will uh, discuss and demonstrate several instantiations of this idea. So here's the outline for the uh, rest of the talk. I'll first talk about an approach that can localize objects with weak image level supervision. I'll then talk about an approach that can generate fine grained details of objects without corresponding supervision. I'll then, I'll then conclude by discussing future directions. Okay, let's first talk about an approach that can localize objects with weak image label supervision. So in this task, we have training images which are tagged with the uh, uh, main object in the image. And the goal is to train a model that can uh, classify the image and localize all the pixels that correspond, it, that correspond to that tagged object class. Now, normally in a fully supervised setting, we would have these kinds of pixel level mask annotations, but here we just have the weak image level tag supervision. Now, the standard way to proceed here would be to train an image classifier because that's the only supervisory information that we have. But if we then analyze which pixels the model focused on in order to classify uh, this image as dog, here you can see that it's only focusing on the dog's head. And this is because the dog's head is the most discriminative part of the object, right? And, and it kind of makes sense why the model would do this because if you just see um, that a dog's head is there, you know that a dog is in the image, right? But this is not the level of understanding that we'd like our model to have. We want the model to understand that all of the parts constitute, uh, all of the parts of the dog constitute a dog and not just its head. 
So in this case, the model is cheating and only focusing on the most discriminative part for image classification. Right? And this is the uh, uh, common weakness of all prior methods trying to tackle this uh, problem. So we came up with a very uh, simple but effective uh, idea okay, called hide and seek. And here's the intuition. If we randomly hide 50% uh, of the image, okay, and then we uh, feed this as training data to train our image classifier, now the model is forced to focus on the visible portions of the image. So by hiding patches, we can force the network to seek other relevant parts. So to give you more details for each training image, we'll divide it into a grid of S by S patches. And then we'll randomly hide 50% of the patches. And we'll do this multiple times. So we'll actually create multiple uh, variants of the original training image. And all of these hidden images will then go in as training data to train our, uh, our image classifier. Now, of course, a priori, we don't know the size and scale of the objects in the image. So we'll actually hide at multiple grid resolutions. Then during testing, we'll feed in the full image to our trained classifier, which will classify the image. And we'll, and we'll use an existing technique called class activation maps to localize the pixels that, corresponded to, that correspond to the predicted uh, label. Now, there is one important detail that we need to address, which is that during training, we're hiding these patches, but during testing, we're not, which means that there's a mismatch in what the model sees during training and testing, which can hinder generalization performance. So what we show in our paper is that we need to set the hidden pixel values to be the mean RGB value in our training data across all training pixels. And if we do that, then in expectation, our, the neural network's filter activations will be matched during training and testing. And empirically, if we set the hidden pixel value to be uh, anything other than the mean, we see a, a significant drop in classification and localization accuracy. All right, so to evaluate our approach, we use the ImageNet dataset, which has a thousand categories and 1.2 million training images and 50,000 test images. So let's first look at some qualitative results. The second column is showing the baseline classifiers localizations, and the, and the third column is showing our localizations. And here you can see that our approach is localizing the monkey, dog, and banjo much better. And quantitatively, we also see a significant improvement in pixel localization accuracy. Now importantly, our approach and the baseline model is using exactly the same deep neural network architecture. The only difference is that the baseline always trains with full images, whereas our approach is training with these hidden uh, patched images. And because we're only changing the training data, uh, our technique easily generalizes across various different uh, networks. So in our paper, we show results for AlexNet, GoogleNet, residual networks, and again, see consistent improvement across all of these uh, different models. Hide and seek also leads to- Yongji, uh, I have a quick clarification question. Sure, sure. So uh, here you're uh, randomly hiding uh, half of the image? Yes. Uh, I mean, what happens if you hide more than half or less than half? Yeah, yeah, so we have, we have a, a, a sort of full analysis in the paper of, you know, the, uh, like the percentage of patches that we're hiding and, and the effect on classification and localization accuracy. So uh, between around 25 to 75% hiding, uh, the results are quite similar. If you hide more than that, like if you hide too much, then what can ha happen is you can completely occlude the main object and that's gonna, uh, that's not good because you're, you're training the model now with the object completely occluded. And if you hide too little, then what can happen is, again, the model can start focusing on the most discriminative part only. OK. All right. Thank you. All right. So hide and seek also leads to a better classification of partially occluded objects. So if we present this image, both the baseline and our model can correctly classify this as crocodile. But if we present this image where we just see the crocodile's arm, right, then the baseline mispredicts it as a trilobite. Okay, which looks like that. So you can kind of understand why it's being confused. 
Whereas our model is still correctly predicting it as a crocodile, even though the most descriptive part, which is the crocodile's head, uh, is not visible. And beyond object localization, we find that hide and seek can improve various different visual recognition tasks, including image classification, semantic segmentation, facial emotion and age recognition, and person re-identification. Now, you may be thinking that you know, maybe this 1% improvement is kind of small. Um, and, I, and I agree with you, uh, but note that here, all we've done is we've just downloaded the code bases of these existing state-of-the-art methods, right? We made no changes to the algorithms whatsoever and only applied hide and seek to the training images and retrained those models. So essentially these improvements are coming for free. And after our paper was published, there have been several other independent uh, rediscoveries of this uh, same essential idea from other groups, again, validating the effectiveness of this idea. So in sum, by forcing the model to consider all object parts, we can learn richer visual representations. Now, having said that, of course, the approach is, without, uh, is not without limitations, right? So uh, our method struggles to separate two instances from the same object category when they're spatially adjacent to each other. And it can sometimes also mispredict the co-occurring context as the object. And a part of the problem why this is happening is because uh, so far we've been treating uh, the, uh, the visual world as a, a stack of static images. However, we know that our visual world is dynamic, which means that there's motion information, right? And the cool thing here is that motion facilitates visual categorization. So the way this butterfly is fluttering actually helps our human vision in identifying this object as a butterfly. Motion also facilitates segmentation. So things that move together should be grouped together. This is the law of common fate proposed by Gestalt psychologists. And I strongly believe that video will play a critical role in uh, creating visual recognition systems that can understand the visual world with minimal supervision because video provides motion and temporal cues for free. So building upon this idea, very briefly, I've created uh, algorithms that can automatically segment the foreground objects in unlabeled videos. I've shown that by transferring those motion segmentations to images, we can dramatically improve the performance of object detectors that are trained just with weak image level supervision. So free motion cues in videos can replace expensive pixel level human supervision when training visual recognition systems. Okay, so, so far I've talked about- uh, pro uh, oh, yep. uh, I just got a, qu a question from the participants. Uh -huh. I'm going to read the question. It says that, how do you ensure that the masks won't bias the classification? Is this because uh, samples, is this because negative samples are also masked at the same rate? Oh, how do you, so what, uh, how do you make sure that those uh, hidden patches don't affect the classifier? Yeah. Yeah, so during testing, we don't hide. So we are always showing the, um, if I go back, uh, we're always showing the full image during testing, right? But during training, we're hiding. And so, yeah, there can be a bias, right? You don't want the model to sort of latch onto these hidden patches and somehow think that that's signal uh, when it's not, right? So there's uh, two properties to ensure that that uh, effect is um, not there. The first is, like I talked about in this slide, we need to set the hidden pixel values to be the mean RGB value in the training data so that the uh, data distributions are matched during training and testing in expectation. Mm -hmm. um, the other, it, the other uh, property of our model that sort of prevents that from happening is that regardless of the content in the image, we're always hiding these patches in a, a similar way where we're dividing the images into uh, you know, a grid and then randomly hiding these blocks, right? So it's completely independent of the content that's in the image. So the model cannot sort of latch onto that information to say, oh, there's a dog if there's some specific hidden pattern. And if it's a cat, it's some other hidden pattern. I see. Yeah. So uh, uh, there's a follow-up uh, question uh, sure. from Bill Gay. 
So he's okay. asking, uh, do you lose data when images are partially hidden? Meaning, uh, uh, do you need more data than to train? Because you're, you know, you're losing some data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great question. So what we find is that we do, um, it's better if you train more, meaning, uh, so when you're training a neural network, right, you can think of this as a way to do data augmentation. Mm -hmm. Like this, this can be interpreted as one way to augment your data. And we find that because we're hiding these patches, it is better actually to train more epochs. So given the same training image, we actually hide it, you know, multiple times, right, mm -hmm. in different hidden uh, patterns. And because of that, uh, you want to make sure that um, over all of these training epochs that at least every, you know, patch is visible at least once, right? So, right. Um, so it is more effective to train longer. Uh, but we do find that even if you train the same amount as you would with um, just showing the full image, there's still an improvement. Okay. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, all right. Um, okay, so yeah, so far I've talked about approaches that can learn to localize objects with weak image level supervision. I'll next talk about an approach that can generate fine grained details of objects without corresponding supervision. So let me first introduce you to the problem. So given these four uh, bird images, can you identify any birds that belong to the same uh, fine-grained bird species? So first Good. of all, it's C and D. Okay, yeah. So somebody guessed C and D. Yeah. So it's really easy to say that A and B shouldn't be grouped with C and D, right? But it's challenging to know should C and D be grouped together or not, right? So if you look very carefully. Uh, the beak in C is yellow and there's uh, you know, white spots on its tail, whereas the beak in D is uh, black and that bird has white strips on its tail. So in fact, it turns out that all of these birds belong to different fine-grained bird species. So what did we learn, right? Why did I ask you to do this? Well, the first lesson that we learned is that there are multiple factors of variation in the data. Right, so these three groups have different backgrounds and different shapes. Right? And the second lesson that we learned is that there's an existence of a natural hierarchy. Right, so birds C and D can are can be first grouped on the basis of their uh, shape and background, but then they can further be differentiated based on their color and texture. So the goal of this work was to create a generative model that can generate fine-grained details of objects. And let me first explain what a generative model is by first contrasting it with a discriminative model. So with a discriminative model, it's trying to learn to discriminate uh, data instances. For example, by learning a decision boundary that separates cats from dogs. Okay? Whereas with a generative model, it's trying to learn the underlying data distribution so that it can sample from the learned distribution to generate uh, new instances. Okay. And all of the approaches that I talked about so far fall into the class of discriminative models. And one of the reasons why discriminative models love to cheat so much is because there's so many different ways in which two object categories can be different. And a discriminative model will always choose the easiest way to separate two classes. Right, and, and uh, a bad thing about that is it might, for example, uh, incorrectly focus only on the background pixels rather than the foreground object. Whereas with a generative model, because it needs to generate all the pixel level details of an object, it's much more difficult to cheat. So Richard Feynman had this very famous quote, what I cannot create, I do not understand. And I think this is very true for our visual recognition systems because generation requires a deeper understanding of the visual data compared to just discriminating patterns. Right? So as an example, if we, if we ask a model to generate a dog, it's not sufficient just to generate the dog's head. If it actually understands what a dog is, it should be able to generate the entire dog. Right? And as another analogy, when we ask our students, right, when we want to see whether they truly understand the problem and are not just memorizing a solution, what do we do, right? We ask them to show their work, right? 
And as humans, we can not only recognize patterns, but we can form models of the visual concepts that we learn about and sample from those models to generate new instances. We can parse an object into different parts and relations. And we can also combine related concepts from multiple models to generate entirely new samples. So I'd like to argue that if we want uh, to create visual recognition systems that can truly understand uh, visual data, then they need to have the capability to generate patterns and not just discriminate them. So to develop our generative model, we'll build upon the Generative Adversarial Networks Framework. And in this framework, uh, there are two competing systems. Okay? So there's the generator G and the discriminator D. And um, what the generator does is it takes in a random noise vector Z, for example, sample from a multivariate Gaussian distribution, and it learns to map that to an image. And what the discriminator does is it tries to tell whether an image is real or fake. Okay? So this is akin to a counterfeiter who is generating counterfeit bills and a detective that's discriminating between counterfeit, counterfeit bills and real bills. And the idea is that as the generator and discriminator compete over time, the generator will get better and better at generating uh, realistic looking images uh, until it reaches a point where the discriminator can no longer say whether, an imi wh whether the generated image is real or fake. And mathematically, what this process is enforcing is that uh, it, it enforces the generated images to match the distribution of real images. In other words, the generated image should look like it has been sampled from the, uh, from the distribution of real images. Now, although this vanilla framework can uh, be used to generate realistic looking images, it doesn't provide fine grained control. Um, specifically, if I take, for example, this image right, of the bird, and let's say I want to keep everything the same, but I just want to change the color of the bird to be blue. Okay? There's no easy way for me to do that in this uh, vanilla framework. So rather than generate the image all at once in one shot, our idea is to generate the image in a hierarchical stage-wise fashion, where we first generate the background image conditioned on a latent background code. We then generate the object's shape conditioned on a latent parent code. And then finally, we fill in the color and texture details conditioned on a latent child code. So the background, parent, and child codes will control the background, object shape, and object texture that gets generated. And to see how we can learn this desired hierarchy where the parent code controls the object shape and the child code controls the object's texture in an unsupervised way, uh, let me explain it through a uh, toy example, okay? So suppose that we have these uh, a toy data set of these random patterns, okay? And suppose that we want to generate two groups. Okay? So a natural way to do that would be to uh, group these patterns on the basis of their shape, right, into circles and into triangles. Um, and then suppose that we also want to have codes that control which shape gets generated, right? So how would we do this in an unsupervised way? Now, one way we could achieve this is by imposing a cyclic constraint, where given the generated shape, we need to re-predict the code that was used to generate it. Right? And so this is a constraint called the mutual information loss, which was introduced in the InfoGAN paper. And basically what it does is it maximizes the mutual information between the code and the generated image. And to see why this would work, Suppose that we instead had these kind of groups of mixtures of circles and triangles in each group. Right? Now you can see here that it would be very difficult to re-predict back the code uh, that was used to generate these images because there's no consistent pattern associated with each group. Right? So by, uh, by maximizing the mutual information, we force each code to generate consistent patterns. Now suppose that these patterns also had color. 
then we could further produce subgroups on the basis of their color. And we can again have codes that control which color gets generated. And to learn the correspondence between the code and the generated color, we can again enforce uh, uh, mutual information laws. So in this example, we've learned a two-level uh, grouping where the parent level groups the images on the basis of their shape. And then at the child level, the images are further subgrouped into uh, on the basis of their uh, color. So returning back to uh, the real images, we can again apply the same idea to group these real bird images into uh, first into uh, these shape-based groups where we have, for example, a seagull-shaped uh, birds in one group and duck-shaped birds in another. Right? And we again have these codes that control which shape gets generated. Right? Now these bird images can then be further, again, uh, subgrouped on the basis of their texture. And again, we have these child codes that control the texture that gets generated. Right? But unlike the toy uh, data set, in real images with real object categories, there are certain properties that need to be modeled. So the first property is that uh, with real object categories, there's usually less variation in shape compared to texture. So the way we model that is by setting the number of unique parent codes to be much less than the number of unique child codes. So in this example, you can see, for example, there's two parent codes, right? Whereas at the child uh, level, there's six child codes. So that's saying there's only two variations in shape, whereas there's six variations in texture. Okay? And the second property that needs to be modeled is that usually there are certain textures that are associated with certain shapes. For example, uh, uh, there are seagull, textures that cannot be found in duck-shaped birds, right? So the way we model that is we set a fixed group of children codes to share the same unique parent code. And that looks something like this. So when this parent code is activated, only one of these three child codes can be activated. So that's saying if it's a seagull-shaped bird, then it should only have one of these three textures. Similarly, when this parent code is activated, then it should only have one of these three child codes, right? So that's saying if it's a duck-shaped bird, then we, we should only have these three uh, textures. Okay, so here's the overall uh, architecture of our um, uh, uh, model, which we call FineGAN. Okay. So FineGAN has three uh, interacting stages that are trained jointly end-to-end -end without any pixel-level mask or fine-grained object labels. In the background stage, the background gen generator will take in a uh, sample uh, latent background code and learn to map that into a background image. And for this stage, we do assume that we have access to uh, bounding box annotations. So what we're doing is we're taking these patches outside of the bounding box uh, annotated regions and using those patches to model uh, the background data distribution. Then uh, in the parent stage, the parent generator will take in a uh, parent code and it will generate a parent mask and an intermediate parent image. And this mask will be used to stitch this intermediate parent image onto the existing background image to create the final parent image. And in this stage, we uh, enforce a high mutual information between the parent code and the intermediate parent image so that this parent code gains control over the birds, uh, the, the shape of the bird. Then in the child stage, the child generator takes in the uh, uh, latent child code to generate a mask and an intermediate child image. Again, this mask is used to stitch this child image, uh, child image onto the existing parent image to create the final image. And again, we enforce a high mutual information between the code, the child code, and this intermediate child image so that this child code gains control over the texture of the bird that gets generated. And we also enforce an adversarial GAN loss so that this final image looks real. Okay, so let's look at uh, fine games uh, stage-wise image generation results. So FindGen first generates 
a, a background image, and then it generates an intermediate image just capturing the object's shape, and then it generates the final uh, image with the uh, texture and color details filled in. And you can see that the generated image looks quite real. Here's another result for a duck. And here are some uh, results for dogs. So um, all we've done here is we've taken the same algorithm and just changed the bird data set to a dog data set. Right? And I particularly like the, uh, the result on the bottom because the background image looks like a very natural you know, grass field and it looks like a dog sort of naturally entered that scene. And here's uh, results for cars. And this is Fine Gang's uh, uh, hierarchical grouping and disentanglement of shape and texture. Okay. So this result, uh, for all these images, we uh, were generated. And um, I'm showing you just four groups. Each of these groups have different parent codes. And you can see the parent codes have learned to map to different shapes, like duck shape, seagull shape, small bird shape and flying bird shape. And each row was generated using a different child code. So you can see that the birds in the same row, right, have consistent texture patterns. And interestingly, the uh, columns have different Z vectors. So it turns out that the Z vector will model the object's location and pose. And here are results for dogs. Again, you can see accurate disentanglement in shape and texture that the model has learned. And here are results for cars. And I think this uh, resu result further nicely illustrates the disentanglement of shape and texture that our model has learned. So what I'm showing you here is down the columns, right? So down the columns, I'm fixing the parent code while varying the child code. So you can see that the shape remains the same while the texture changes. And across the rows, I am keeping the child code fixed while varying the parent code. So you can see that the texture remains the same while the shape is varying. Right? And there are two uh, additional interesting observations. So first is that even though we never had any part annotations, part semantics are automatically discovered by the model, right? So if you look at the last row, you can see that the, the color of the wings are consistently colored black. Right? And the second interesting observation is that we can relax the code constraints that we had during training okay? uh, when we're generating these images during testing. And that allows us to generate, for example, this red seagull that you see in the last row, which never uh, existed in our original training data set. And finally, uh, this video uh, best demonstrates all the disentanglement that our model has learned. Okay? So I don't know how smoothly this will uh, play for you, but if it doesn't, I can send you the YouTube links that you can check out uh, later. So on the, if you focus on the left panel, I'm just changing the background code right now, and you can see only the background changing. Now I'm just changing the um, parent code. You can see only the shape changes. Here, I'm just changing the uh, child code, which only changes the texture. And again, I want to emphasize we don't have any mask or object labels for supervision. And then finally, when we change the random Z vector, it changes the object's location and pose. OK, so to recap, in fine game, the generated image is conditioned on a set of latent codes, each of which learn to model pose, background, shape, and texture. And we wanted to extend this model so that the generated image is conditioned on a set of real images. Specifically, we want to take the pose, background, shape, and texture from four different images and then combine them to create the final generated image. And we want to do this in an unsupervised way. So this was our first attempt. Given a real image, we train a set of encoders, which will encode the pose, background, shape, and texture codes. And then we feed these codes into our FindGAN generator to generate the image. And we train the encoders and generator uh, by enforcing an L1 loss, which basically means that the generated image right, 
should be identical to the input real image. However, um, this, there, there are many issues with this setup. Okay? So there's one, sh for example, there's one shortcut that the model could take, which is to model everything about this image with this uh, single Z vector. Okay? And if the problem with this is that if it does that, then it's going to ignore all the other codes, right? which means that the desired disentanglement between pose, background, shape, and texture will not be learned. So what we do instead is the following. We'll train the encoders and the generator separately, meaning there's no direct connection between the two. And then we'll try to match their paired image code distributions. So specifically, given the real image, and the encoded codes and the sampled uh, latent codes and the ger generated image will use adversarial uh, training to match their paired image code distributions. And effectively what this will do is it will enforce that the generated image looks real and it'll also uh, enforce that these predicted codes look like they have been sampled from the same prior distributions as these sampled latent codes. So this is the uh, result for our model, uh, mix and match. So on the top are four real input images, and on the bottom is our generated image. And it's, the generated image is generated by taking the background factor from the first image, right, the shape from the second, texture from third, and pose from the fourth image. And you can see here that our model is accurately uh, disentangling these different factors and combining them uh, to produce a final uh, realistic looking image that combines all those factors. And again, if this video isn't playing that smoothly for you, I will send you the YouTube link so that you can check it out. Okay, so um, there are some other interesting results that we can generate using our mix and match model, right? So, for example, I wanted to see uh, what would happen, right, if we want to take this yellow rubber ducky and put it in this image's background and this with this image's um, object texture, right? So it looks something like this. Um, and again, interestingly, you can see that uh, part semantics has automatically emerged through the model, right? So it's, it knows that the belly of the bird should be red. And here's a, a result for uh, angry bird. We can also colorize uh, sketch images. Okay? So again, uh, taking the sketch image, taking the color, background color from this image and the foreground uh, color and texture from this third image. And we can also animate objects in a static image, right? So what we're doing here is we're taking the background shape and texture factors from the static image, and we're combining that with the pose factor from this uh, video, right? To generate this animation of a bird, which, which uh, moves in the pose uh, of this reference uh, video, right? Reference bird in this video while maintaining the background shape and texture from the original static image. And finally, we wanted to also see how useful is the learned representation. So specifically, we're using the learned representation to group real images into fine-grained object categories. And by hierarchically disentangling the shape and texture factors, we find that our model is able to produce clusters that are significantly more accurate than those of state-of-the-art deep clustering methods. And if we look at the qualitative results shown on the right, so each row is a different cluster. Uh, you can see that our model is uh, focusing more on the fine grained shape and texture details of the birds for grouping, whereas the baseline models are largely grouping based on uh, common background color as well as coarse uh, uh, shape of the birds. So in sum, by forcing the model to generate fine grained details of objects, we can learn much richer visual representations. Okay, so um, in the last part of the talk, I want to uh, briefly talk about uh, the future dire directions that I'm interested in. 
uh, keeping in mind the big picture goal of learning to understand the visual world with minimal supervision. So first of all, I'm very interested in continuing my uh, research on unsupervised disentangled representation learning, where we can further uh, disentangle the representation to capture parts, right? So for example, just being able to uh, control and change the uh, head color of the bird while keeping all the parts, other parts intact. I'm also very interested in hierarchical scene generation where we can first generate a scene and then gradually insert objects into that scene where we again have control over uh, the, each object's pose, texture, and shape. Um, but what's really exciting here is that this would be useful not only for image editing, but here the model will need to learn about the physics of the scene, right? as well as object relationships. So I think there's many interesting and exciting directions uh, to explore here. I'm also very interested in multimodal learning. So as humans, our experience of the world is profoundly multimodal, right? We use vision, uh, you know, audio, touch, smell, uh, taste to sense our world. And what's really interesting is that often these uh, different signals, right, are time synchronized. Right, so uh, when I take this water bottle and I, you know, I, I grab it and, and I look at uh, the bottle as I do that, there's a correlation between what I feel and what I see, right? And similarly, when I clap as I look at my hands, there's a correlation between the sound and the, and the vision, right? So these signals can potentially be used to supervise each other in place of expensive human labels. And I've made some uh, initial progress in this direction, but ultimately I'm very interested in having a robot that can have multiple sensors and learn about the visual world um, through these multiple senses of information, just like we uh, humans do. And that leads me to the next uh, topic of interest, which is learning and environment, right? So as humans, we learn through exploration and interaction with other humans and objects and environments. And so there's been a, a recent push by uh, some researchers in our community uh, proposing to go from these fixed closed world uh, image and video data sets to open world dynamic environments. And I think this is the right direction and there are many interesting and challenging problems that need to be addressed, including lifelong learning. So how do we create uh, systems that can gradually acquire more knowledge about the world without forgetting about things that it has already already learned about. A few shot learning where in the real world we have long tail distributions where certain categories uh, appear very frequently but most categories appear very rarely, right? So how do we create systems that can learn from very few instances of uh, a visual concept? And finally, I'm really excited about real-time online learning where the system needs to quickly adapt to the dynamically changing uh, environment. All right, and lastly, as our visual recognition systems are getting more uh, accurate and being deployed in real world applications, questions regarding fairness, bias, uh, security, and privacy are becoming more important than ever. So I've been particularly interested in the privacy aspect. Right? Um, and as an example, we have smart cameras and home robots, which can improve the quality of life of their users, but they also uh, uh, present privacy concerns since a hacker could hack into the stored uh, visual data and potentially steal sensitive information. So there's been some uh, approaches that propose to anonymize the sensitive information, like the, uh, let's say a human face in these kind of data sets, uh, but they don't produce photorealistic anonymizations. So I've been very interested in creating uh, new uh, anonymization techniques that can anonymize data in a photorealistic way. So here's a one uh, sort of initial effort in this direction. So on the left is the original video and on the right is our anonymized video where we've uh, sort of changed the identity of the person, right? But in a photorealistic way where we can still interpret what's going on. And because of photorealism, we can also directly apply an existing computer vision technique. So here we're applying an action detector that can, that can still say what this anonymized person is doing. Right, so here the person is you know, putting makeup on their lips. Okay, and lastly, um, uh, to, to demonstrate how, uh, you know, how well our anonymizations work, 
the, um, I want to conclude my talk with this game. Okay, so the name of the game is Guess That Celebrity. Uh, here are three anonymizations of really, really famous people, and I've given you hints below on, uh, on, on who they might be. Okay, so can, can you guess who this person is, right? So this is a very famous politician. Okay? So it's Hillary Clinton. I think maybe some of you might have guessed correctly. This is a super famous uh, basketball player. Okay? So it's uh, Yao Ming. Okay? And lastly, a uh, very, very famous actor, Jackie Chan. So probably not who you thought it was. All right, so in conclusion, there's been tremendous success in computer vision, but most of this success has been limited to specific domains in which lots of labeled data can be easily acquired. So my research focuses on creating algorithms that can learn to understand visual data with minimal human supervision. And of course, this is challenging since there's limited supervision and the models could easily cheat. But hopefully I've convinced you that with the right constraints, we can force these models to behave in desirable ways with little to no supervision. So code and additional results for the projects that I described are available on my webpage. Um, there are some other topics that I've also worked on, which I didn't have time to uh, uh, talk about in my talk, but which I'd be happy to talk about in our meetings. And uh, with that, I like to thank my wonderful students who led all the uh, research projects that I described today, as well as the funding agencies that provided the financial support for the work. All right, so thank you so much. I'd be very happy to take uh, further questions.